It's Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. We're going to cover this one this week and next week as well. And last week's conclusion was about keeping our hearts based on the people that we looked at. They failed to follow the Lord because they were not able to keep their hearts in the right place. Today, it's Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, the birth of Jesus Christ. It's going to be a little bit different than what you used to hear during the Christmas time because I'm going to be focusing on a few very theologically compelling concepts. And we're going to delve into that a little more than usual. Since we didn't finish verse 17 last week, let me share this with you. It says, 14 generations, three times. What's the significance of 14 generations here? To better understand this, we have to get into the word David in Hebrew. So as you can see, we have three letters here. Just like in English, if you have A, B, C, that's three letter word, this three letter. And in Hebrew, you read from right to left. The first one sounds like the. The middle one, the. Last one, d. The first and last one, same syllable, same sound. The middle one is a different sound. So if you look at it in the regular order, it's David, David, we call it David. So what's the significance of this name? This is the chart showing, table showing the alphabet of Hebrew uh, language. When you say alphabet, that's actually from Greek word. Greek alphabet starts with alpha, beta, alpha, beta, alphabet, alphabet. That's what it is. But chronologically speaking, Hebrew language came way before Greek. So this is the alphabet of Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, and it has a value column as well. Each letter has number attached to that. Not just one. For example, the first one has a couple of values attached to that, but it only shows one. First one reads as Aleph. Second one is Beth. Again, it's very similar to Greek, but it's older language. So if you drop that small sound there, uh, alphabet, alphabet right there. So it's kind of from the Hebrew origin. That's how you can see. Since each letter has value attached to it, let's take a look at the middle one first. That one is from the chart, that one. It's number six. Okay, so this one has value of six. Other two, same letter. And from the chart, the fourth one has number four attached to it. Each one has value of four. Middle one was six. So if you add them all together, what do you get? It's not a difficult question. It's 14. It's not too difficult. We're all good at math, right? It's a 14. Hence, 14 generations because verse 1 talks about David, King David. And throughout the gospel message and the Bible, we hear David over and over again. So this is one of the approaches we can see why Matthew mentioned 14 generations three times. Nobody knows exactly why, but people, some scholars study this one, and we come up with this conclusion. And funny thing is, David, David has three little words, has a value of 14. And it's repeated three times here. If you remember Revelation about the sign of a beast and then number 666, it's not about real number 666. You have to understand Hebrew, Israel, old, ancient way of thinking process. The 666 must have something to do with the name, the value 666. It's not real number 666. That's what we think. So if you see 666, whoa, that's not good. But that's the way we see or interpret that sign. But Hebrew lead, readers, the Israelites, they must have looked at it differently. All right. 
before we get into Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, we have to look at the parallel passages from Luke to better understand what happened. In there, in the sixth month, Gabriel, the angel, came upon Mary. He says, in the sixth month, what does that mean? Sixth month of what? To better understand that, you have to look at the prior verses, especially from verses 5 through 25. It talks about Zechariah and Elizabeth. An angel came upon them and told them, you are going to have a child. They were barren. She was barren, but at their old age, they were promised to have a child whose name was John. John the Baptist. John, that's Greek name, but it means grace of God as well. It's all about God's grace. And this one, the second bullet point says this, And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. When it says favored one, that means you are receiving God's grace. That's their expression of saying that. So, verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together. She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. So she became pregnant before they lived together. Again, you guys are familiar with this passage, but virgin birth, a lot of people that I spoke to, I heard this. I can, you know, believe whatever the Bible says, but virgin birth, I cannot believe that. Except for that one, everything else sounds okay. The problem is, we need to have faith to understand this or believe this. In Hebrews, it says this, by faith, we understand that, okay? It's not about me understanding something, so I have faith. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, the creation. But the worldly sense, the secular people, the way they say it is this. Some people say this, okay, faith, my definition of faith is I'm going to believe just about anything that I hear. That's not good because that means if somebody says 2 plus 2 equals 4, I'll believe him. If somebody says 2 plus 2 equals 7, I believe him too. I agree with them. That's wrong. You cannot do that. Some people say, oh, I like that person. He's such a humble person. Uh, he's handsome. So I'm going to trust him and listen to him. How many times did you get disappointed about this person who you trust? It happens all the time. And some people say, when I agree with what they say, that means Okay, I have my own thought about something. If somebody says something that I agree, then I'm going to believe that. That's faith. Or if I understand 100%, then I will believe it. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when I was little, I was going to school in Korea, middle school, high school, some unimaginable math problems come to me. And what in the world is this? And some kids are so bright, they know exactly what it means. They know how to approach and solve that issue or problem. I don't understand, but they understood. Just because I didn't understand about this problem, I cannot say that's wrong. How about the Christians? How are we supposed to approach this? Virgin birth or creation, whatever it is. We're supposed to believe and have faith in these things because it's in the Bible. Not because somebody told me, just believe, then you're going to be okay. No. Is that in the Bible? Is that what the Bible says? If the answer is yes, then we are going to believe. Okay? That's the starting point. In our daily lives, those two characters, I use it often, so you already know these two characters, right? My thought versus others' thoughts. The worldly perspective shows you this. There's no one absolute truth. I have my own understanding about something. That person or they have other understanding about the same subject matter. This is how I see it. My parents see it differently. 
So we just agree to disagree. It's all relative, different approach. I'm right, he's right, she's right. Everyone has good point. We have to include all the thoughts. If you answer questions that way in your examinations, multiple choice questions, hey, they all have good points. I can answer any way I want to and I'm gonna get 100%. Try it and let me know what you get. And a lot of people say, you gotta change. It's a new norm or it's an improvement from the old way. A lot of people say that. Lastly, it's relevant for today's world. Bible is old fashioned, outdated. It's not relevant to me anymore. And that's why a lot of people go to church, don't even bother to read the Bible or meditate on it. But those are all worldly standards and perspective. For us Christians, we have to put the Bible in the middle. When we do that, what happens is this. There is one absolute truth, meaning we have the same starting point. Let's say two plus two equals four. Whoever comes into the room, when somebody looks at it, that's the correct answer. It doesn't matter who you are. It's equal to everyone. Bible is the same thing. Bible is the standard, the absolute truth. It doesn't change. No matter who you are, we are going to come to the same conclusion. And it's transformative. If you follow the Bible, then you will be able to truly improve yourself. You're going to be a different person. I've been coming to church all my life, basically. But I didn't become a Christian until after I turned 36. It's been a great journey. I'm so excited about this journey, and then I'm so happy that I see you guys all the time. It's transformative. It's a different perspective about your life. And it's a constant. It doesn't change. The Bible does not change. That's why it's one absolute truth. So you think about in your relationship with your friends, for example. When you say, he or she's my best friend, you don't refer to a person who changes her or his mind all the time, never show up in the meeting or gathering on time, break all the promises he or she makes. You don't really consider them as your best friend. But somebody keeps their words and then always reliable, then he or she can be your best friend, right? So that has something to do with the word being faithful. If you look at the Bible, if you always go back to the Bible, then you will find something faithful there. The definition of being faithful is this, being worthy of belief or trust. Bible is it, the Word of God. So always, when in doubt, go back to the Bible. Don't make a mistake like Robom. We checked about his adventure last week. He didn't even listen to this spiritually discerning, mature people. He listened to his friends who grew up together. Don't make the same mistake. Always go back to the Bible and listen to what it says. Again, if you have a spiritually mature person or people around you, please go seek their advice, biblical advice. Okay? So birth of Jesus Christ, verse 18, we covered it already. And from there, we talked about virgin birth. And Joseph found out. He found out she's already pregnant. They're not together yet. So he was unwilling to put her to shame. The Old Testament law says you're not going to survive if you did something wrong during that time period. So he was considering, what should I do? And the angel asked him, showed up in his dream, saying, Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Okay, so let's go back to betrothed. What does that really mean? Engagement, in a way, in today's term, it's a little bit more binding than engagement in today's term. In the old days, take a look at this one from Deuteronomy. If there is a betrothed a virgin, and a man meets her in the city and they do some uh, sexually immoral thing. 
they both were put to death. And then the man, the reason why he's accused of what he did was because he violated his neighbor's wife. So betrothed doesn't mean you're married, but it means that it's husband and wife already. That back then, it was legally binding. So to break it, you had to have some kind of official process you have to go through. Anyhow, that's what happened. Uh, verses 22 and 23, it says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. To fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. As I mentioned earlier, everything we had to go back to the Bible. And this is the same thing. Biblical authors, Matthew, everybody else in the New Testament, they use the Old Testament to refer back and say these are the things why it happened. I'm going to explain to you later. How about today's preachers, pastors? They're supposed to do the same thing. When they say something, they have to have a biblical support as much as possible. I'm not here to give you my advice, personal advice based on my experience and learning from other settings. I'm here to preach the gospel, what the Bible says, so the word of God get into you and Holy Spirit can work in you. I cannot change anyone based on my insight. But the Word of God can change anyone. It says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And that's exactly what's from Isaiah chapter 7. Emmanuel, right there. And that's the situation where Isaiah was talking to King Ahaz. So, which means in parentheses, God with us. Okay, Jesus came to this earth. So, how can we say Emmanuel, God with us? Does that mean Jesus is God? Yes, he is. Because if you look at John chapter 1, verse 14, it says this. Let's read that box together. Ready? Go. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. If you look at chapter 1, verse 1 from John, how does it start? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that word became flesh and dwelt among us, God with us. And who was it? Glory as the only Son from the Father. Obviously, it's referring to Jesus Christ. So technically speaking, he's still with us, Emmanuel, in the Word of God. Holy Spirit lives in us. He's still with us even though he will physically come back in the future. Verse 21 says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus is Greek name, same word, same name of Joshua in the Old Testament. That means Jehovah will save. Because he will save his people from their sins as the name indicates. Why his people? Does that mean there are other people who are not his people? Answer is, yes, there are. And some people may ask, how about John 3.16? Okay, let's go there. In fact, let's read 16 and 17 together. Ready? Go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will be saved. And it says, the world might be saved. So God loves everyone. God is love. Yes, that's true. So the world might be saved through Jesus. People may argue that. 
If that's the case, if God is here to save the entire world, every single one of us, that means we don't have to be a Christian. Every single one of us means any people in any different religions or even atheists who doesn't believe the existence of God at all. Everyone will be saved based on that logic. But Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 says, He is going to save His people. John 3, 16 and 17, let me put that in the middle. And let's see the context of this two verses. Two verses before this one, it says this, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. Sounds good. But to better understand this passage, you have to go back to what happened in Moses' situation, lifting up this bronze serpent. It's captured in Numbers chapter 21. It says this, at the end, Many people of Israel died. When Moses lifted up this bronze serpent, not everyone was saved in that situation. A lot of people died, but whoever looked at that serpent survived. And it says, the Son of Man has to be lifted up according to the crucifixion. With that, what's coming afterwards? If you go to 18, it's clear. It shows two different group of people. First one is whoever believes. And the second one is whoever does not believe. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Okay, please remember there are differences between his people and others. That's why we're saying chosen ones. So faith and salvation. I mentioned about through faith you know, faith you understand. God created everything with his words. It says this in Romans chapter 10, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All right. It sounds like John chapter 3, 16. And it continues this way. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? If you don't believe him, how can you call on him, right? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? If you never heard about the gospel message, how can you believe anyone? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Somebody has to preach and teach about Jesus Christ. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? To help you better understand, let's keep the first verse out there. And the second bullet point, I'm going to restructure them. Okay? From the bottom. Somebody has to be sent. Who's sending them? God is sending those people. God called them and sent them out to preach the Word of God. For example, great examples are pastors. I have a calling from God, so I have to go and preach the Word of God. That's a true calling. If you're a true Christian pastor, it's kind of a funny way of saying it, a lot of pastors don't believe in the Bible, unfortunately. That's why they preach and teach something other than the Bible, which is easy to do. They sound like just motivational speakers. The one who sent, their role, their responsibility as a preacher and teacher is they have to preach and teach the Word of God, nothing else. Then people will hear the Word of God through those people. Then, because they heard about the Word of God, they will believe in the Lord. Only after they hear the word of God, they will believe in the Lord. And the words of the people who are mentioned here, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's not just anyone. That's captured in verses 14 and 15, right? There's some true preachers out there who preach and teach the gospel message what's in the Bible, the only few, but still, there are still faithful pastors out there. But 
they have not all obeyed the gospel. Romans is clear about this. There's some faithful servants who preach and teach the word of God, but a lot of people do not listen. They don't obey the gospel. For Isaiah says, again, it's quoting Isaiah, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? It's referring to Isaiah 53 verse 1. But in that context, though, God is speaking there. That's where the description of suffering servant about Jesus. You have to actually start from Isaiah 52 verse 13 and entire chapter 53 to better understand what it is. And the second bullet point, again, it says this. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. If a pastor at church is there to entertain you or motivate you, how can you hear the word of Christ? They can say one sentence, one verse out of the Bible and then say some other things. Oh, this person lived in a small town, poor guy, but he grew up with all these difficulties. He became a great person to help a lot of people. Jesus was like that. There's so many stories like that out there. And this one clearly says, hearing through the word of Christ and faith comes from that hearing. Even if you go to church, if you don't really hear the word of God, how can you believe God? Your version of God may be manufactured based on your understanding, own understanding, not based on the Bible. If you create an image of God, not based on the Bible, but your own thoughts and kind of diluted messages, then what are you doing in fact? You're creating an image, unbiblical image of God that's a very definition of idolatry. Application, this is the conclusion for today. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. You must heard about this verse many, many times. Like newborn infants, that's assuming that the baby is born. You cannot say, okay, baby is still in my belly and he will or she will seek for the spiritual milk. No, I don't know if you have experience of looking at small, just newborn babies. They always cry, mainly two reasons. When they feel uncomfortable because of diaper issue, Second, more importantly, when they're hungry, they're going to cry. So what do you do when they're crying and hungry? If you know that the babies are hungry, then you're going to give them the milk. Do they take a time and, okay, I'm going to just, half of them I'm going to waste and maybe I'll just take the bottle and I don't know. No. It's like life or death situation. Spiritual milk is word of God that's been preached. How often do you feel like, oh, I want to listen to the word of God? How often do you see, just like babies who are having this great milk, you come to the church and feel like, start listening to the word of God, ah, oh, this is it. When I first took the Bible class about 20 years ago, that's when I become a Christian. First class. The pastor was going through all the Bible verses, which I heard before, because I've been going to church for, for a long time. It was a morning class from 7.30 to 11.30. We have a couple of breaks, but the whole morning, I was crying. 36-year-old man crying in the Bible study, regretting I wasted my life up to that point, not paying attention to the Word of God. What have I done? I was chasing after American dream, working hard and getting my degrees, and just like any other immigrants. But to me, that was wasted time. I'm not saying you had to quit working hard. You had to quit studying hard. You got to do the best you can as a Christian. But 
there's something more than just working and study in our lives. Because it says, second half, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. It's a conditional statement, grammatically speaking, and the translation is correct, but it's not really a conditional statement because it says, like newborn infants, it's assuming that you're already born. When you become a Christian, how do we describe that? I'm born again. It's been 20 years, but I'm still like baby. That's not normal. It cannot happen that way. If you're truly born again Christian, you're going to grow. It says, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. You're going to grow up spiritually. There's no way you can stay still. If somebody does not grow for 10, 15, 20 years, something's not right. Spiritual growth, same thing. We tasted that God is good because He forgave us, He saved us. Then our response, natural response as a newborn baby or infants, is to long for the Word of God. And that'll make you grow spiritually so you can also impact other people's lives with the Word of God and the way you live. That's going to transform you as well as others.